basically, the Greeks in, in modern philosophy, in modern philosophy, we treat problems like um, theodicy, the problem of evil, right? Um, the divine presence, the question uh, to the degree to which um, God is in the world, interacts with the world or external, um, transcendent, um, not involved in worldly activities. And then finally of individual or human responsibility, the question of human autonomy, what is up to us? What can we do for what are we responsible in other words, the free will question. These three problems uh, we understand to be distinct and they're treated as distinct in modern philosophy. But the Greeks treated these three problems together as a, a single issue. And this issue was divine care. For them, the question of evil, uh, why do bad things happen to good people? Why are there natural disasters um, and so forth? was bound up with the question of divine presence and, or uh, conversely, divine transcendence, uh, divine withdrawal or absence from the world. And then also divine influence or lack of influence over human actions. This was all bound up in one question. And the, the topic, the, the word that the Greeks used to discuss this question was pronoia, which means uh, literally forethought, pro, for, and the noia is, is thought or thinking. So it's forethought or foremind, but it's also a completely normal colloquial Greek term for caring. So when you read in a Greek text that somebody has pronoia or is exercising pronoia, it means they're planning something, they're caring about something, going to take care of it. And this is why uh, I titled, gave the book this provocative title, Did God Care? Because on the one hand, I wanted to uh, uh, wake people up and <laughs> say, hey, here's the, here, here's the big question, right, that so many people have with regards to theological and religious issues. But on the other hand, the question of provenance or pronoia is really about care. It's about do the gods care? And if so, how do they care? Um, and this was not a minor question. If you look if you actually read ancient philosophers, what you find is they all agree that the gods care in some way. Um, they disagree as to what this care looks like. It's very rare to have philosophers who say, oh no, God stays out of it. So pronoia is divine care. And the, what I wanted to do in this book is look at, well, everything having to do with divine care. Um, the reason I did that is when I was writing my first book, Apocalypse of the Alien God, I was looking at these Gnostic texts from the Nag Hammadi corpus uh, discovered in 1945. And they talk a lot about divine care. Uh, pronoia is really important in Gnostic literature. And I didn't understand this concept. And so I had to go find scholarly literature about it. And there wasn't a lot, actually. There, was, there certainly was no book the, a pronoia book that told you everything you needed to know about divine care in ancient philosophy. So I thought, well, someone needs to write that book. So Plato, he, he's not the first um, Greek writer to talk about pronoia. Um, like I said, it's a, it's a normal Greek word. Um, and there were some uh, early Greek philosophers who talked about divine care uh, here and there. Um, and Herodotus, the historian, is actually the, the oldest Greek writer on record to connect the word pronoia or care to, um, divine, um, to divine care, divine matters, and care for the cosmos. He's talking about intelligent design. Isn't it nice that things are put together the way they are and the animals are the way they are? Only God could have come up with that, right? Um, Plato, however, is the, as with so many questions, the philosopher who really gets it started, gets it going. And his dialogue, the Timaeus, which is concerned with uh, cosmogony or the, the origin of the cosmos, uh, is the dialogue where he, some of his most important contributions to uh, thinking about divine care uh, take place. What's really special about the Timaeus 
um, is that Plato describes the world as being made by a craftsman. The Greek word here is uh, demiurgos, means a, a craftsman, somebody engaged in making things out of things, okay? And there are basically three factors at work in the creation of the world. One is the craftsman, who is good. Uh, second are the uh, eternal forms, okay? That, uh, to which he looks in some respect, some manner, uh, as uh, providing a blueprint for him to work with. And then there's what is called the receptacle, the Greek word is hora, which means space or place, which is, uh, um, its function is not entirely clear, but it seems to be the place that it works and the place that the, the, the creation happens. And Plato is sketchy on the details, but there are these three factors of craftsmen, the forms, and the chora or receptacle place. And the craftsman, Plato writes, is a good being who wants the world to be as good as it possibly can be. And thus he creates the world with great care. It is with great care, that is pronoia, that the demiurge made the cosmos. So why are things not so perfect down here? Is it, uh, uh, what's the cause of that? Did the craftsman have a problem? Was he not capable? Uh, Plato gets at this in a number of ways in the Timaeus. Uh, one is he notes that the receptacle, the place where the creation happens, is a source of chaos and disordered movement. And so the things made in it also participate in chaos and disordered movement in one sense. Um, another thing is what you alluded to already. Plato delegates some of the work. Uh, has the Plato has the demiurge delegate some of the work to beings whom he calls the young gods. And these are the gods of traditional Greek mythology, uh, Zeus, uh, Hera, and the rest. And it is to them that Plato gives the task of actually fashioning human beings once the craftsman has made the soul of the world, uh, the, the, revel and the, the various uh, uh, celestial spheres, everything that moves in an, in an ordered, uh, eternal way, um, the craftsman makes himself. But the things that need to, that, that are going to participate in disorder, he leaves that to the young gods. And thus the young gods are also uh, culpable beings in a way. The demiurge then uh, withdraws from the creation, kind of steps back from it. So this is, uh, this is very important for subsequent thought about divine providence, especially among thinkers who uh, privileged the thought of Plato, so-called middle or Neoplatonists, later Greek philosophers who were really into Plato. They looked at the Timaeus as uh, their authoritative text for how the world came about. And what they saw is there are some beings to whom the creation and administration of things down here in the world, including you and me, people, has been delegated. And these, are, these people are not the highest deity. They're not the craftsmen. They're not the first god, nor are they forms. No, no, no. They're lower beings. And then second, there is the problem of this origin of chaos or disordered motion, the, the chora or receptacle. And later, and already with Aristotle, the receptacle is identified with matter. And so when we get to Roman philosophy, people often see matter as the source of this um, uh, chaos or disordered motion. I guess adding on to that question, just kind of comparing, uh, where did the Stoa differ from, like you're saying, the Middle Platonist and later Neoplatonist and their understanding of uh, providence and God's role in creation? Well, the, the Stoa are, are interesting in so many ways, and I really the most relevant of the Greek philosophical schools for us in the 21st century. You know, um, the, the Stoic philosophers, beginning with Zeno uh, already in the fourth century, but especially Chrysippus um, and Cleanthes, they, they don't see um, the world as being made by a craftsman who is aloof from the world, 
Rather, they identify the creative activity with the ongoing flow of the eternal creation that is the world that we inhabit already. So if you're into things like subatomic particles and string theory and looking for a universal fiery substance underlying all things eternally active, this is very opposite to uh, Stoic philosophy, Stoic physics. The, the Stoa um, identified providence and fate with one another and also with the rational principle that organizes everything in the cosmos, the, the logos. So while Plato describes a craftsman looking at the forms, making things in this chaotic space, and then eventually delegating the lower parts of that creation to younger deities, um, it's more gradated, it's more graded, right? There's a gradation of different beings and different levels. The Stoa offer a, a panentheistic perspective where God is eternally participating in the creation all around us all the time in an active and uh, completely rational way. So instead of being a, a good intention from God at the beginning of things, providence is in Stoic philosophy, a kind of divine fire that we're all experiencing insofar as we're being rational and using our heads at any time. The big one is the eternal return. You got to get that in. Right. Always. That's, always. Yeah. That's in that's in the, the, the Providence book. That's in Did God Care? Because one of the things I looked at is divine foreknowledge. You know, do the right. gods know everything? Part of if you're going to care about something, you have to understand it or at least be aware of it. And so when yeah. ancients asked, it does God know if God is transcendent, how can he have knowledge of temporal things? And Plotinus writes, you know, the one is not aware of what is happening to you and me. Right. The one is the, not involved. One is completely insulated from everything. Yeah, yeah. The one is not of... thinking or, or descending down here. There's, there's an emanationist schema in which we are all ultimately emanations of it, but the one is not involved. That's, that's not what it's about. Um, but the other philosophers who certainly argued that the, the gods, even, even the highest deities are very much knowledgeable about human affairs. And the Stoa argued this as well. And there's a fragment, I couldn't really call it a fragment, I suppose it's a testimony in the fourth century Christian bishop Nemesius of Emesa, okay? Hmm. And he writes that this, he gives us our one witness for how it is that the, uh, trying to explain how the Stoa conceived the mechanism of divine foreknowledge. And this is that, the eternal, the universe is uh, is not eternal in Stoic thought. It, it, there's a big bang and then a big explosion at the end. That's interesting, but it's kind of eternal in a way because it repeats over and over again. There, there's a straight line, but the the line bends back on itself. You know, the front gets gets connected to the end because it actually just goes around and around. And the reason that they say that it's always the same that the world can only repeat itself in the exact same way is because Plato writes in the Timaeus, God wanted it to be, the, the Demiurge wanted things to be as good as possible. And therefore, when if the world is going to repeat itself, it couldn't, there could be no variation, uh, uh, variation from the plan of the Demiurge would be a variation from the best possible world. And therefore it can only be exactly the same as if the otherwise the demiurge would have wanted a uh, less possible world mm -hmm. and the gods surviving the great cataclysm that happens at the end of every cosmos they're the only beings that get to see um, the beginning of the new world after the end of the last one they've already been through the whole story so they know what's going to happen when the world repeats itself and this is why they know future events they've already lived it before Oh my gosh, I, that's this is so great. <laughs> I mean, it's wacky. It's wacky. I love yeah. it. But but that's only that's only one late witness, Nemesius. You know, none none of the Stoa themselves <laughs> seem to say that. To my next question, I guess we talked about you know paranoia, but there's also this concept um, and debate within philosophical circles in antiquity about um, not only does God care in terms of like the whole, but does God care about us individually as people? Um, so I was wondering if you could touch upon that a little bit. 
Yeah, this is a, a, a light motif of ancient discussions of uh, divine care and, and also theodicy. And if you, if you read books written by modern philosophers and theologians about uh, the problem of evil and the problem of suffering, um, written from a religious perspective, you find that a lot of the, the same questions and also the same answers that were debated and that were proposed and debated in antiquity are still being trotted out today. That was really one of the, the fascinating I found, fa fascinating things that I found uh, from doing this project. So one of the answers to the question of, well, if God cares or if the gods are involved in human affairs, then why do bad things seem to happen to good people? How could God allow these terrible things to happen on earth is, well, God or the gods seek to administer to the bigger plan, okay? The big picture, which is a very good one, but not necessarily every little thing. That is, the gods attend to the whole, that is the universe, the cosmic scale, rather than the parts. Um, th and this is a distinction that Plato makes in his dialogue called The Laws. Um, like the, the Republic, The Laws deals with political philosophy, designing an ideal city and constitution. But in The Laws, Plato also talks about a variety of other philosophical topics. And these, this includes uh, theodicy, the problem of evil. And uh, towards one of the latter books, uh, book nine of the dialogue, uh, there, there is a, a discussion of whether God actually attends to little things. And the, the answer that Plato wants to give us is, well, let's not look at God as being uninvolved in things, but at the same time, we don't want to keep God to, to, to make God completely involved in personal affairs either. So the way that Plato tries to have it both ways here, right? Um, that is keep God involved in cosmic matters in some respect, but not necessarily make God responsible for every little thing is to make this distinguish to, is to distinguish between care for the whole and care for the parts. Thus, uh, something you, you can still read in theologians today is that, well, God is not responsible for the actions of you and me, nor is God responsible what happens for you and me. But that does not mean that God is not involved or that God is not responsible for the cosmos in general. The cosmos was set in motion. And look at it. It is beautiful. There is regular movement in the planets. The, the world is a uh, can also be a very beautiful place. In other words, God can be responsible for a lot of good things without being responsible for bad things on the microcosmic scale. This is a perspective that uh, Plato advances in his laws and that is taken up by virtually every subsequent Platonist. It's a, it's a very important for later Platonic philosophy. Of you know these figures who are being influenced by these different forms of thought. And I think that there's no figure who better exemplifies that than Philo of Alexandria. He's doing something similar to Plato with his, uh, you know, God designating creation to his powers, right? So um, what does Philo do? How does he synthesize Platonic and Stoic ideas of divine providence? Philo is really interesting. Um, you know, the, the great scholar of Philo, David Runia, um, he... He famously said, or is reported to have said, this is an apocryphal quote. I've never heard David say this. I've just heard people ascribe this quote to him. Um, if we didn't have Philo, we'd have to invent him. <laughs> that is, Philo is a incredibly Hellenized Jew who is also incredibly Jewish. Uh, he is completely committed to what he understands the religion of Israel to be and his Judean identity. Uh, and he is also incredibly committed to the philosophy of Plato. He sees no 
contradiction between these two matters. And so with him, what we get is a Jewish Platonist who is really Jewish and really Platonist uh, in the uh, first quarter, second quarter, uh, active in the, the 30s and 40s of the uh, first century CE. Right? Yeah, fi so he was a, he, yeah. Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt, but like, yeah, Philo's definitely got that um, super Hellenized paideia going on with, <laughs> you know. Totally, yeah. totally. He loves paideia. He loves paideia. And and he, he also loves Moses. You yeah. know, of early from early Christian sources in the second century, we know there must have been somebody like him running around. You know, we, we have we have Jews and early Christian, the earliest Christians. We, we already have very Hellenized uh, uh individuals who are really into scripture, who are really into the Bible. Um, so we, with, with Philo, we get somebody who's not just into Hellenistic literature, uh, but in, into Plato in particular. So he's exciting. Um, and what he does with Providence is, is very interesting and tells us a lot about um, the transformations of Providence in Roman philosophy. What Philo does is he on the one hand, takes a lot of Platonic ideas, and he is, uh, like I said, a, a committed Platonist. So he describes the creation of the world and human beings in his uh, work on the creation of the world, um, following the narrative of Genesis, Genesis 1 to 3, but he's also using a lot of the language of the Timaeus and episodes from the Timaeus in interpreting Genesis. So, for example, when it comes to the creation of uh, human beings, what uh, Philo does is he sees that there's one description of the creation of, he, of Adam in Genesis 1, 126 to 27, and then another description that's quite different and that scholars today recognize has a totally different literary tradition in, in chapters 2 and 3. There's uh, God saying, let us make it man in our image and likeness in Genesis 1. And then there's the narrative of him making Adam out of clay and then blowing a uh, spirit or pneuma into his face in Genesis 2 and the episode with Eve and the serpent in the following chapter. These are two separate episodes. Um, and so already in Philo's day, uh, Jewish exegetes, that is interpreters of Genesis, uh, we're debating how to make sense of these two narratives that are quite different from one another, how to reconcile them with one another if they both belong to a single revealed scripture, um, the book of Genesis as revealed to Moses, right? And Philo's way of going about it was to uh, see the creation of Adam in Genesis 1 as being a creation of the rational part of the soul. This is the part of the psuche, that uh, is, has pneuma, the divine spiritual element. And this is also the rational element. That's, that's, uh, it's a logokos. On the other hand, the creation, uh, the molding of Adam and Eve, this describes not just the body, but also the forming of the soul of Adam. And in Genesis, God often speaks to himself using the first person plural, the royal we, right? Let us make, okay, right? Philo asks, if God was alone in the garden, who is he speaking to? And of course, the question, the, the answer that he gives is, well, there were other powers. He had uh, little delegates working with him. And he calls these powers uh, dunamis, and they're clearly angels of some kind. And these are the ones who form the irrational part of the soul. Thus, God himself is not responsible for making the part of the soul that wants to eat too much cake or smoke cigarettes or do uh, bad self-destructive things that involve desire and uh, lead us down the, the path of wrong. Rather, uh, God is only responsible for making the good part of the soul, the part of you that wants to uh, use your head well and live well, which for Philo means to, to be a good Jew. So these, these powers mentioned in the creation of Adam, as described by Philo, when God says, let us make, these are basically the young gods from Plato's Timaeus. 
So he's a he's a Platonist, and he uses the Timaeus and the Timaeus's descriptions of uh, uh, divine care and which agents are involved in making which parts of the world and especially human beings in a particular way. But at the same time, Philo uses Stoic philosophy mm -hmm. uh, very intensively. Uh, it's very important for his ethics, but it's also important for his theory of provenance. And this is because Philo is committed to the historical veracity of uh, the, is, the Israelite, uh, I should say, Judean scriptures as he knows them. Um, he's reading them in Greek, okay, in Greek translation. This translation is called the Septuagint. And so when he's reading the Septuagint, he also reads descriptions of divine intervention, uh, miracles, because the, the, the Hebrew Bible and its Greek translation, the Septuagint, are full of descriptions of miracles, right? Um, God intervenes with, uh, to, with Jacob. There's Jacob's ladder. God intervenes with, to help Joseph in Egypt. God intervenes so that Sarah becomes uh, uh, fertile after being barren so that Abraham can be get by her. All of these examples, Philo sees as examples of direct intervention, direct care by God on the human plane. And this is something Plato doesn't do. And when he describes this activity, he explicitly keys it as divine care for particulars, for particular human beings. And this is something that only Stoic philosophers had previously argued in the Greek philosophical tradition. So what we see with Philo is when it suits him, he uses platonic proof texts and platonic allusions to explain what's going on in scripture. But in other cases, he prefers Stoic proof texts and Stoic allusions to make sense of the scriptural text. He's blending Platonism and Stoicism. And what is it, the factor that you have in common in uh, both cases is scripture itself. Philo is committed to the seeing scripture as something that is revealed and that whose truth value is, uh, is assured. And therefore the question is not, well, which part do we do we keep which part do we throw out it is which of uh, uh, lens is provided which of the lenses the various lenses provided by greek philosophy makes the most sense of this passage that moses gave us moses and the prophets gave us yeah i think uh, what fascinates me about philo um is that he he really is the culmination of all this but he's he's not completely wedded to Platonism. He's not completely wedded to the Stoic um, philosophies. He, he's very much, if you read him and you take Philo for Philo in David Rooney's terms, uh, if you just let Philo be Philo, Philo at the end of the day very much is, you know, a committed uh, Jewish intellectual using the Septuagint, um, using the Pentateuch to, um, interpret the world you know he and he really is bringing this hebrew revelatory concept and putting it together with these platonic and stoic ideas in such fascinating fun ways you know i, I love it um, yeah he's an innovator no question yeah, i love um so i guess my final question here would be Throughout this discussion, you're seeing a lot of exchange, you know, exchange of ideas, different um, solutions to very difficult problems about providence, about, you know, the care of God and his intervention or lack thereof in the world. So what does all this discussion tell us about the dynamic cultural exchange that's happening in dialogue between these pagans, Christians and Jews, Gnostics, for lack of a better term? Um, what's happening here? What is this telling us? So Philo is a great example of how uh, Jews and Christians moved in the salons and educated circles of the, the Roman Empire. For example, he is sent during the reign of Caligula as an ambassador uh, representing the interests of the Judeans because Caligula has decreed that he wants to put a statue of himself in the temple and the holiest of holies, okay? This is as blasphemous as it gets. There needs to be some response 
uh, from the Judean side. And this response is going to be diplomatic. And Philo is the head of that delegation sent to Rome to try to talk Caligula out of it. Luckily for Philo, by the time he gets to Rome, Caligula has already been assassinated and uh, a cooler emperor, Claudius, has uh, prevailed. Phew, right? But Philo doesn't just turn around and go back to Jerusalem. He stays in Rome and there is a body of his writings that seem to engage Greek philosophy very closely using scripture as a proof text much less often than in his other writings. And one recent theory uh, by a, a great biographer of Philo, uh, Marin Niehoff, uh, is that Philo wrote these philosophical works when he stayed in Rome uh, in uh, what was probably the, the last decade of his life. Uh, he probably went to a lot of parties and talked to a lot of very educated Romans who were interested in discussing philosophical questions with him. He knew a lot about philosophy, but they probably didn't know much about Judaism, and they certainly probably had not read the Septuagint. So he needed to discuss these topics on their terms, not referring to proof texts from the Bible. And he wrote some of these texts, so Nihof argues, um, for in that, that particular context. So we know that, that Greeks and Christians and Jews were mingling with one another. We also see this with Justin Martyr, who in his uh, dialogue with uh, Trufo, he begins, this, uh, this is a dialogue between um, uh, a Jew, Trufo, and uh, uh, Justin himself, uh, representing the new philosophy of Christ. And the frame narrative for this dialogue puts Justin meeting uh, a group of Jews at a public place, okay, during the Bar Kokhba revolt. Uh, and the, this is, these are the uh, revolts uh, transpiring in the middle of the fourth decade of the second century, right? And these are refugees from those revolts, from the conflict between the Judeans and the Romans um, down in Judea. And they, they meet uh, in this public place and Justin can recognize that he can start a philosophical conversation with uh, this group because one of them is wearing the accoutrement of a philosopher. He's got the long beard, he's got a robe. There's a way that philosophers dressed, it was a subculture. And so he sees it from afar, ah, this guy, He's going to be okay. So they get to talking philosophy in this public space. And they talk about providence, actually. Divine care. Uh, does God care for uh, only the holes, the big picture, or for individuals, the little things? Or is it something else? You know, they, they get into this question. And this leads them naturally into a conversation about whether or not Jesus was the Messiah and what the early Christian movement has to say to the Judean philosophy and theology of its day. That's the dialogue, right? And what we see here is obviously a fiction. It's an artifice on some level on Justin's part, but it's one that he must have thought would have been convincing for his audience, namely that some individuals, total strangers walking around in the market could spot one another and see from visual cues that they're both interested in philosophy and they get to talking. And what do they do? They say, ah, I'm, oh, I'm in scripture too. I also read the Bible. Well, have you heard about Jesus? Well, we, we don't recognize him. Oh, you don't? Maybe you should. And speaking as philosopher and philosopher, you definitely should. And that's, that's how it gets going, right? It also reminds me of things like um, Lucian of Samosata is a big favorite of, of ours here and uh lucian wrote uh passing of peregrinus and uh texts like that a true true story he's very uh versed in these oh. jewish texts it's very strange like you read true story and uh lucian is lucian and his band are going to the isle of the blessed but then they after they're leaving, they're basically going into like the apocalypse of Peter or something like that. And, and he's yeah. taking stuff from the book of revelation and, you know, and, and passing of Peregrinus and uh, pseudo, uh, pseudo Philos 
uh, lover of lies there, you know, there's lots of references to like, uh, Hebrew uh, would be messiahs and, and would be philosophers. So it's very interesting, you know, that like these, these aren't impermeable boundaries between these people. They're all living mm -hmm. together. Like you said, they're all in dialogue. Um, Dr. Burns, this has been fascinating. Uh, it's been an honor. Uh, where can people find your books? Uh, do, do you have anything coming up? Just feel free to use this time to plug whatever you'd like. Oh, um, my first book, Apocalypse of the Alien God, Platonism and the Exile of Sethian Gnosticism, is available from University of Pennsylvania Press. Many online booksellers sell it. And the same is true of Did God Care? Providence, Dualism, and Will. This is published by Brill. And this is a hardback. It's not cheap. But a, a paperback should be out by the end of this calendar year of this book. And so it will become much more affordable very soon. Um, I would also, I, I must mention um, this new book on the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Nag Hammadi Codices that I co-edited with a great Dead Sea Scrolls scholar, Matthew Goff. There's a volume of papers that, uh, for the first time, brings together scholars of the Dead Sea Scrolls with scholars of the Gnostic Gospels to exchange their knowledge and talk about what these two incredible corpora have to say to one another. Uh, this is a hardback book, but all the papers have also been published under an open access license and are available for free download from the official Brill website. Fascinating. Um, love your work. Uh, keep it coming. Um, we hope to have you back soon. And thank you so much for being so generous with your time and your knowledge. And you have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much, Jason.